Hi everyone, this is Tamur. Welcome to my channel, The Cloud Security Guy. Uh, in case you are new here, I talk on a weekly basis about things pertaining to cloud security, artificial intelligence, and general cybersecurity career advice. So today is a, like a special video. It's both an educational video and an announcement for a course which I've just recently launched uh, in, on a topic which I'm always very interested in, which is the payment card industry data security standard, the PCI DSS. Okay, it's a course about PCI DSS. Now, if you're not aware, the new version of the PCI DSS standard was released just a while back. It was very like a, to a lot of hype, a lot of fanfare. The new version was developed after a lot of collaboration and feedback within the industry, you know. And one of the major goals was to add in flexibility for new types of technologies like cloud and, you know, updated technologies which has come up. So it's a topic, PCI DSS is a topic I feel everybody should know because every bank, every company that accepts payments is going to be interacting with the standard in one way or the other. If you're in cloud or cybersecurity, then you will be involved in PCI DSS related activity at one point or another. So I did want that's the reason I created a PCI DSS course. And I, I've, I've worked on PCI DSS for the past 10 years in the Middle East. So I knew I definitely know what the standard is and how it works. So that's the reason I made this PCI DSS course. And actually I put a whole module here in this video because I just wanted to show what's it about to you guys. Uh, before we move ahead, guys, uh, please do like this video if it's useful to you, subscribe to this channel and share it. It will really help the channel to grow and it will reach the maximum amount of people so they can benefit from these videos. Okay, so about this course, it's called the PCI DSS Foundations to Mastery course. I've made it for people who want to understand the standard from scratch. Okay, I'm not assuming that you know what PCI DSS is. It takes you from the basics to the advanced topics. Okay, and... So where I've launched this course, guys, so I was working on Udemy and other things, Skillshare, but uh, I w I've been trying to like move to a new platform now because making courses, you know, educational courses, it's something I edu I encourage everybody to do. Whether you are a newcomer in cybersecurity or cloud security or you're an experienced guy, I always recommend people to make cybersecurity courses and like publish them. It really helps you to grow. It it'll, it becomes a source of passive income for you. Uh, and it's a really, it's a great way to really uh, push yourself out of your comfort zone. I am slowly moving my courses to a platform called Gumroad. I'm moving away from platforms like UDB and Skillshare. I've seen they're not very friendly for instructors and they've become very saturated. And the overall quality and support has really gone down. They don't give you much flexibility in how to interact with students. And that was a big thing for me. So that's the reason I'm moving to a new platform. But it's about Gumroad. So how does it look like? So this is basically my course. Uh, this is uh, the landing page. So basically it's going to be, uh, we're going to walk you through the PCI DSS standard, how it works, what are the key topics about it. I'll go through the syllabus. I, uh, I'll shortly be starting the module here and I focus on one particular requirement, which is about storing of cardholder data. So that is what I'm going to show you. This is how the syllabus looks like. There are around 20 lessons. So let's start with the cardholder data one and see like what I'm talking about, what are the controls, and let me know if you found it useful or not. Okay. Hi everyone, welcome to this module now. Uh, this is quite possibly the most important requirement for PCI DSS. A lot of times when people talk about PCI DSS, they're talking about this particular requirement only because in, it basically captures what PCI DSS is and it's one of those unique things which PCI DSS has, okay? Uh, and I'm talking about the protection of cardholder data. Uh, I remember what I told you earlier about not memorizing any requirements. It doesn't apply to this one. You should definitely know this requirement inside out because this is where the auditor is going to focus the most. Okay. This is where if you like goof up and you don't follow it properly, you could potentially fail the audit. So this is very, very important. So when we talk about cardholder data, basically you're talking about any information printed, processed, transmitted, or stored on a payment card. Okay. If you are like accepting payment cards, and like you're expected to pro protect that data, okay? Whether it's printed or stored on a database or internal public network or maybe a cloud, okay? So the essential part is know where you're storing that data, okay? And what you don't need, do not store it, okay? And have some way of finding out where you're storing that data. You don't want the auditor finding it, you want to find it out yourself, okay? So uh, those are things. So PCI DSS is very, very clear about what you can and cannot store. And so you should know what you're storing, where you're storing, how you're storing it to make sure you're following PCI DSS standards. So just to take a look, 
when you talk about cardholder elements, uh, what are we talking about? Okay, so there is something called the uh, account number, the cardholder number, basically the PAN, which people call it. That's a 16 digit number. You have things like the cardholder name, the expiration date, the service code. On the back, you have the track two data, okay, the magnetic stripe data, and you have the CVV code, you know, you, the one you use for e commerce transactions. Basically, when you're storing this data, it has to be protected. Uh, when you're store, showing this data, it has to be protected. When you're printing the data, it has to be protected. The problem usually comes as people unknowingly, uh, they end up storing uh, and not protecting this data, which is where the vast variety of problems comes in. So how, what does PCI say, say? Like what should be stored? Okay, first of all, so it divides data into two elements, okay? You're talking about cardholder data and sensitive authentication data, okay? So your PAN, your cardholder name, expiration service code, that is cardholder data. You can store it, but you have to protect it, okay? And the other one, which is sensitive authentication data, like the track two data, the CVV code, the PIN and the PIN block, the PIN, you know, the PIN you put in when you're doing a transaction. That is sensitive authentication data or SAD. Uh, do not store it. If you're not, you do not have to store it after the transaction is authorized, okay? The, the vast majority of time, those big compromises which happen, malicious people, they can, they find out this data being stored and they use it to reproduce your card and, uh, and conduct fraudulent transactions, okay? The CVV code is, you know, is the three digit code which you use for e-commerce transactions, card not present transactions. So, and the pin block is of course the pin which you're using, the, it, it, it becomes a pin block, it gets encrypted. But even if you, even if it's encrypted, you cannot store it, guys. So just remember, yes, certain things you can store with protection, certain things you cannot store, okay? And this is the main thing you have to keep in mind. If you're storing the cardholder name and the, what do you call, if you're storing the PAN, you have to encrypt it or possibly if you're showing it, you have to do other things. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do is, because there are many, many ways of doing it, uh, what do you call, uh, protecting it when you're storing it, when you're showing it, when you're printing it. So I want to go one by one. What are the steps which PCI tells you? So first is masking. Or well, what is masking when you're usually, when you're displaying it on screens or receipts or printouts, uh, it's not to be confused with the other requirements like storing, okay? So when you're showing it on the screen, when you're, what do you call, and that person does not have a requirement to see it, okay? So what you can do is you can mask the pan. Basically, you can XXX where the card numbers are. Uh, apart from the, you can, the maximum you can show is the first six and the last four. Everything else you can simply mask out. So you can see this is the stored pan. When it's being shared on the screen, you can completely mask it, okay? We're not talking about how the data is stored. We're talking about how, when it's being shown, okay? When paper we see is computer screens. And when there is no business need to view the entire pan. Sometimes, like your call center agents or some other people, they might have a need to see the full pan, okay? You need to document that. But nine times out of ten, you don't have a need. Okay, so it basically concealing certain digits during display. Yeah, even how, they, regardless of how the pan is being stored, you can mask it here. Okay, so the first step is masking. Find out where you need to mask it, and actually, masking should be the default. Uh, only when somebody has a business requirement, if your system has the ability to mask data, just turn it on across the board after you check with the business. Okay, so this was the first one, which is masking. The second one was is truncation. You can also truncate the data when you're storing it. Uh, truncation is similar to masking, but the, you don't XXX out data. You simply discard those digits. So you can see here, this is the full pan number. And when you're storing it in a database, you could simply discard it, okay? So basically it makes the card unreadable by removing a segment of that data. And it usually is used, I've seen it being used in databases and files. So even if an attacker is able to get access to this data, he can't do anything because those digits have been removed. Sometimes uh, companies can use this as a method also. This is more on the storage, okay? Okay, what else is there? Uh, you can do one-way hashing when you're storing data. What is a one-way hash? It's like a cryptographic process. It takes your data and it converts it into a different type of string. So every time you do it on a pan, it's going to show a different result. Why do you call it a one-way hash? Because it's irreversible. So you can't get that, uh, what do you call it? From the hash, you can't get the card number back, okay? So a lot of time people use it to check if data has been modified or not, but you can also use it for storing it, okay? So it basically, uh, you are creating an irreversible one-way hash of your data. It's up to you if you want to use this process. I've seen it being used. Just remember, you cannot go back. I mean, from that hash, uh, you can't use it for like uh, future transactions, okay? Because that data is being irreversibly changed, okay? And uh, like sometimes when you can't, you don't have to store 
like you do there is no need for masking there is no need for truncation and you don't need this data you can store it as a hash uh, th that's one way is possible so we've talked about truncation guys just to go back so this was truncation when you're storing it this is hashing now you know the difference one thing very very important guys you cannot store truncated and hash versions of the same payment card within your cardholder environment okay and, uh, because what happens is these can be correlated what do i mean by that if attacker has access uh, what do you call to the truncated and the panned and the hashed versions of a card number they can actually get back the original pan based on these two data okay so when you're storing it in databases in flat files like spreadsheets or maybe like backup audit logs you may have to protect it and do not store them together okay use one of the two but do not store them together a lot of people i've seen sometimes they forget about this requirement and they truncation and hashing is being done at the same time please do not do this okay okay what else is there uh, tokenization tokenization is a very simple process what happens is sometimes you've seen that when you hash it or you truncate it the 16 digit format changes right it's no longer a 16 digit number tokenization is a process that replaces the original card number with another 16 digit number okay that to it's called a token the token may look like a legitimate card holder number but it's not it has no value to an attacker okay so usually what happens is uh, this is reversible so you can detokenize it you have something called a token vault so with the from that uh, token you can back, get back the original card number okay you can get it back so tokenization usually i've seen it it's being used when uh, people want to store card holder number card holder data uh, for future transactions but they want to make sure it's secure they, and they don't want that format to be changed so i mean you can uh, there are multiple ways of doing it you can do it from the pan you can generate it randomly you can have like a token vault uh, a token vault being created which is tokenizing and detokenizing data there are multiple ways of doing it just understand the token it preserves the original format the 16 digit pan and you can reverse it so you can tokenize and detokenize it sometimes your databases they can't store like large amounts of data which would come out if you're hashing it and they need a 16 digit number so tokenization helps you out tokenization also sometimes helps you when taking it out of pcs scope but there's a lot of work to be done around that um, so th this is the basic difference between tokenization and other functions and uh, lastly is encryption which is the more usually the most common thing uh, to, 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 encryption is a bit similar to tokenization in that the, like the pan is being replaced by other data that has no value but encryption is somewhat different because first of all it doesn't preserve the original format and it uses like a key manager like a vault with a cryptographic key okay and it uses like a key manager because your key it uses a key and an algorithm to generate like a huge number which uh, you cannot get back the original card number from that data okay so and typically the data size increases like the it doesn't preserve the original format uh, so the, it is it's really up to you what you want to use some people prefer tokenization because they want to restore that format in a 16 digit or some people prefer encryption so it's, it usually depends on your business requirements uh, just know one thing so I, I talked about a key right you need a key to encrypt that data so that key uh, you have to encrypt that key also with another key and you have to store that separately it's like you can refer to the requirement just know when you encrypt data a card holder data you have to encrypt it with a key and you have to protect that key also you have to encrypt that key again so just remember that when you're talking about encryption so i know it's a lot to take in guys and just go through this revise it and slowly slowly you'll start to understand it you don't have to implement all of these things remember that you can just make do with encryption or hashing or tokenization just know these different requirements okay and when you talk about like i remember i talked about finding out data so you need to review your data sources to make sure that uh, you're not storing cardholder data unencrypted you don't have any sensitive authentication data look at your transaction logs the transaction data your trace files you know sometimes people turn on tracing for troubleshooting a lot of times that starts storing unencrypted data okay you look at your database schemas your database schemas might show you if there has any card number there okay uh, look at your backups any existing memory crash dump files okay your dlp logs lots of things are there so just starting from the left you can look at your payment terminals whether you're masking or truncating all the data you're not storing any sensitive authentication data you're not storing any data on the terminal look at your screens and reports okay is there anybody who has a requirement to view data cardholder data if not just mask and truncate it on the reports can users exfiltrate this this data what if you can stick it out okay what if somebody has remote access they can stick out this data do you have any dlp controls 
uh, what about databases and storage okay so when you're storing that data do you have you put on encryption there uh, is there any sensitive authentication data usually people what they do is they have some sort of a tool which scans their databases and it gets them a report you cannot do it manually there will be millions of records you cannot do it manually and lastly file share a lot of times file shares are a blind spot people don't know that uh, employees are putting cardholder data in excel sheets or what you call flat files and they don't know it and suddenly during the audit it comes up so make sure you're scanning those also and make sure that it cannot be exfiltrated out so these were the things guys i've spent more time on this because this is very very important to know okay so key actions find out first where your cardholder is data is don't just use a technical method talk to the people also and draw a cardholder data diagram sit with your business and find out what the flow of data is from the point the data is captured the cardholder to till such time it's authorized and stored okay so you'll find it in databases file shares even emails you'll find it at cloud outsource providers and lastly i want to talk about okay what if you can't implement pci controls so we i want to keep this in mind we're going to talk about something called compensating controls later on so that is something you have to keep in mind what if okay you can't encrypt it because it's a legacy application right so what are you going to do then so this is something i want you to keep in mind okay what else so you need to have a data retention policy maybe you don't need to store cardholder data after 30 days okay just delete it then there's no need to keep it you should have a data flow diagram the auditor is going to ask uh, how do you find out first of all where your data is stored do you have some sort of a tool which is regularly scanning your servers databases laptops okay and most important guys please do not store sensitive authentication data after your card authorization is done uh, remove your track to data remove your cvv don't store pin blocks masking out pans on customer receipts and if you are storing it the cardholder information then please mask it or truncate it or secure it to encryption okay but don't make sure that it's the databases or the storage is accessed by as few people as possible okay so this was the requirement guys i hope it was wasn't too much just take your time go through the standard the main thing is find out where your cardholder data is and protect it accordingly and don't store data unless you do not need it so uh, just go through this module one more time it will revive you so you have a better idea of it and make notes and then try to implement it within your environment i can guarantee you if you're if you're in the card business you will find cardholder data where you did not expect to find it and that that's a common thing don't don't get scared by it just make sure you have a process to remediate it going forward okay guys i'll see you in the next section now uh, hope you had like uh, you got a better idea now and i'll see you in the next module Okay guys thank you very much for listening to that if you found it useful please do let me know like this video and like uh, let me know in the comment section i've put in the course link in the links below in the description and i put in a, like a coupon also so that you give like a 20% discount if you're interested in this course let me know if not let me know what other courses you think you might be useful i'm happy to work on those also thank you very much guys uh, please do like and subscribe to this channel and share this video as much as you can it will really help the channel to grow Thank you guys and I'll see you in the next video.